two chapters of the Bible, concentrating on the next to the last chapter. And before we do, let's just ask the Lord's blessing on our meeting tonight. Our God and Father, we bow before you humbly, coming into your presence, the very God, the creator of all things, who gave your son for our redemption. And he was willing, in obedience to the Father, to go to Calvary and to suffer and die. Immortal God suffering death is amazing to us. But he suffered the wrath of God for the sin of the world. And we thank you, Lord, that you were willing to pay that price for our sin, to bring us to the Father in your righteousness, your holiness, and to give us a, a, an anticipation of an eternity with you. And we're going to look at that tonight, Lord, and we pray your leading and guiding and your blessing on the meeting and upon those who hear these words that you have prepared. We give you praise and thanksgiving. And ask, Lord, for a safe return for our Pastor Mark and his family, that you'd bring them home safely, also that you'd be with those who are sick and shut in, that they would know your comfort, they would know your healing, and be restored to health and strength. So we ask this in our Savior's precious name. Amen. I've heard about a man who uh, didn't know where to read, start reading the Bible or studying the Bible, so he opened it up and put his finger on, the, on a section of the Bible, just put his finger on wherever he opened the Bible to, and it said uh, Judas went out and hanged himself. He thought, oh, that's not where I want to start. So he flipped a couple pages and put his finger down, and there was a verse, go and do thou white likewise. Oh, he said, that's, that can't be. Well, I thought I'd take a look at that and try that, and I said, Lord, give me some inspiration. So I opened my Bible and put my finger, the poor ye have with you always. Okay, that's where we'll start. <laughs> so the question I has is, I heard of a young man who, in talking to his pastor, said, you know, I'm, I'm saved, and I know I'm going to heaven, but I really don't think I'm going to enjoy it. And a pastor looked at him and says, what do you mean? Well, he says, I don't like to sing, and I understand there's going to be a lot of singing. And he says, I'm not real good at praying, and I imagine there's going to be a lot of prayer. He says, and I've heard these people doing praise, and he says, I'm just not into that. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, a question I have for you tonight is, do you think heaven is kind of boring? Is it something you're really not looking forward to? What do you expect? What do you expect to see or to experience when you get to heaven? We're told we can talk to God. Well, yeah, we can talk to God. We can look at his word and we can, we can say we understand what he's saying to us. But it's not like we can go to a parent and say, here's my problem, can you help me with this? Not that God doesn't help us that way, but we have a God and a heaven that's ethereal. It's something that we can't quite put our senses on other than our heart knowledge and our head knowledge. We're told when we put money in the offering, we're investing in heaven. Well, Vance Havner, a pastor, once wrote, a man is just as rich as his investment in the bank of heaven. Where your heart is there, where your treasure is there, shall your heart be also. He also wrote, if you are a Christian, you are not a citizen of this world trying to get to heaven. You are a citizen of heaven making your way in this world. Do we pray when we pray, ever so come, Lord Jesus? Is, is that any part of what we pray as we do, as we go before the Lord? Of the seven Revelation churches, the church in Sardis in Revelation 3.11 was told, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast to that which you have, so that no one may take your crown. Now, one would argue with that word quickly. This was written 2,000 years ago by the Apostle John. That 2,000 years doesn't equate to quickly in our jargon. But what you have to think about is an eternal God a God who has dwelt in eternity for millennia, for thousands, millions, billions of years. What's a short 2,000 years to God? Um, 
Now, our response to this, I guess I should start this, see how we can go. There we go. What would you like to, ex what do you expect heaven to be like? And huh, it worked. There we go. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast to that which you have so that no one may take your crown. We just looked at that. We don't know how God defines quickly. Well, we, we realize that God's idea of quickly is totally different from ours. He who testifies these things says, yes, I am coming quickly. And there's where we say, even so come Lord Jesus. Do we have a desire to see Jesus coming to the clouds to call his church to be, meet him in the air? Is that our response? He said to the church of Ephesus, in fact, as he said to the seven churches, the phrase, to him who overcomes, I will, but only the six of the seven. And we'll take a look at those. To the church of Ephesus, he says, give him to eat of the tree of life. So him who overcomes, I will, give him to eat of the tree of life. Essentially, we receive everlasting life as we become, as we go through and as we suffer through as an overcomer. Then we have in Revelations 2.11. Now, this is the preamble where, because we're going to be looking at Revelations 21. But the idea of what went on before this, I think, is important. So we're looking at this aspect of the overcomer because it's the overcomer we're going to see is the, uh, uh, is the obedient one in heaven, and the rewards are there. So to the church of Smyrna, Revelation 2.11, you're told that not, he who overcomes, I will, uh, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Now, from a uh, blog called gutquestions.com, quite simply, the hidden manna, beg your pardon, we didn't get there. Give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows except he who receives it. Now here we have, quite simply, the hidden manna, a symbolic picture of Jesus Christ. As the manna of Exodus is sustained and strengthened the Israelites for the 40 years of desert wandering, so Jesus strengthens and sustains us spiritually as we walk through this life on our way to heaven. Jesus is the manna from heaven, the spiritual sustenance that we need, and it is promised to us. The manna is hidden in that it is given exclusively to believers in Christ. Only believers will reap the benefits of salvation. Jesus himself made the connection between the manna of Moses' day and his own provision of salvation. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat, and not die, I am the living bread. So we see that Jesus is using an example of a, an earthly manna to explain that he is the heavenly bread come down from heaven, and whosoever eats this bread. Now, we don't eat the Lord Jesus because what we're doing symbolically is we're accepting him as our savior, and in a sense, we're, we're taking this bread. And when we go through communion, we have the bread and the wine speaking of his body, which is given for us. Then to the church of Thyatira in Revelations 2, 26 to 28. Give he who overcomes, I will give power over the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter. They will be broken to pieces, even as I receive from my father and I will give him the morning star. There's something truly special here. The, uh, those who overcome will be reigning with Jesus during the millennium. We're not going to talk about the millennium. I'll, I'll explain a little bit later that the millennium precedes this chapter that we're talking about tonight, chapter 21. That uh, reigning with Jesus will be something truly special. Jesus will be sitting in Jerusalem, the capital, and reigning from there on his throne. Interestingly, I had always heard that Jesus would share the throne with David. 
And in my studies, I found out that that Jesus would not be sharing his throne. He would be on the throne. He would be the, the regent of the, t- of the uh, city of Jerusalem. He would be the uh, commander. The present world is full of unrighteousness. For instance, dictators, war crimes, terrorism, poverty, the innocent suffer injustice is rampant in this world. On every level of society, there is so much misery, so much wrong with this world. Then to correct this, we will need a rod of iron. So we see that, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. It's a rod of iron. It's strict authority. We will have strict authority from God to apply God's uh, means of correction. To walk into situations and start setting them straight, we'll be able to liberate the innocent people who have been suffering under oppression and abuse. Then we'll have to break some some vessels. That could be the example of the rod of iron. As it were, we're able to help a world that is falling apart start getting back together again. Then we have to the church in Sardis. In Revelation 3, 5, to him who overcomes, I will clothe in white clothing. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but will confess his name before my father and before his angels. The downside of that is He who does not confess me in this world, I will not confess him before the Father. So this is a promise to one who overcomes that he will be dressed in robes of white, the purity of the salvation that we have in the Lord Jesus. John wrote that the church um, in Sardis uh, had little strength. Well, he he did that for the church of Philadelphia, too. Um, So to be an overcomer, he's guaranteeing an entry in the of his name in the book of life, and that would be Philadelphia. Make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will go out no more. And I will write unto him, upon him, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem. So we see this city named is here in the early part of Revelation, Revelation chapter 3. The New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, from my God, and my new name. The... Church of Philadelphia, he said, uh, had little strength and had kept my word and had not denied my name, a true example of an overcomer. And he's guaranteed an entry of his name in the book of life. Now, in Revelations 3.21, the church of Laodicea, that's not who to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. What a difference. What a difference. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Wasn't that what the disciples were arguing about with Jesus? Who was going to be on his right hand and who was going to be on his left hand as he sat there before uh, with the Father? Uh, in John 14, 2, <coughs> John alludes to this heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And then in Luke 23. Verily I say unto you, Jesus told the thief on the cross with him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. <clears throat> as I get older, I can't be I can't be talking as long because. I used to be able to talk for two days in a row and not have any problem. (coughs) Paul is alluding to how... uh, (coughs) In 2 Corinthians 12.4, he was alluding to how he was caught up into a paradise and heard unspeakable words which are not allowed for a man to utter. I'm going to have a problem tonight. What's amazing is, why didn't Paul talk about what he saw? If he was in paradise, he saw some incredible things (coughs) that John talked about, uh, as we'll get later into Revelations, that uh, were so incredible that uh, he wrote them down because he was told to. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little while. But um, 
Paul heard unspeakable words. And uh, he, the question is, is if he was caught up in paradise, what, what paradise? What is paradise? Well, <coughs> in Revelations chapter 1, John was told to write what he saw. You see, Paul was an apostle. But his spiritual job, like all of us, <coughs> I'm sorry, was evangelism. John's spiritual task, as Matthew Henry describes it, John was a beloved disciple. He was under the New Testament as a prophet Daniel under the Old, a man greatly beloved. He was a servant of Christ. He was an apostle an evangelist, and a prophet. But John was told to write what he saw. In Revelations 2, 7, He who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give him, give to eat of the tree of life. Now we saw that, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Here the tree of life, which is in the middle of the paradise of God, is the same tree mentioned in Revelations 22, 2. In the midst of the tree and of the river, from here and from there, was the tree of life. That's the end of the Bible. And as John is describing heaven and describing the tree of life there in heaven and the fact that it was between the tree and the walk. <coughs> we have another tree of life in Genesis 2, Genesis 2, 9. And now the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is present to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, that midst. So there we have the, this tree is in the middle of things. And a tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's interesting because the Genesis, the Revelations 22 tree is fed by water, we'll see, proceeding from the throne of God. The Garden of Eden tree was watered by the dew that came in the morning. Um... The tree of heaven, of Revelations 22, <clears throat> brings forth different fruits. Some versions say 12 fruits in their season each month. Now, if you have, if you're dwelling in an arena where time doesn't have a beginning and end, how do you measure a month? <laughs> That's a question I have but I can't answer. But it talks about a month from our perspective of, of uh, 30 days. And what we have is a cycle. He's representing a cycle of about 30 days, and each 30 days, a new fruit is produced. So then the question is, what is your favorite fruit? Are you going to have to wait for so many cycles to get your favorite fruit? I think what we're having here is a tree that is full of fruit all the time, good for any of the most uh, exquisite tastes. In other words, we'll be able to taste fruit like we've never had here on earth. Now, before going on, <clears throat> I should mention that this chapter, chapter 21, follows the rapture of the saints, the great tribulation, the thousand-year millennial. You know, there's the tree. The thousand-year reign of Christ, the millennial. The great white throne judgment, which follows the millennial. And then the new heaven and the new earth. That's where we are, the new heaven and a new earth. <clears throat> So what does John in Revelations 21 tell us about this new heaven and new earth? The chapter focuses on the new Jerusalem. This is not the earthly, historic Jerusalem of the tribulation from Revelations 11, 2, and 8. Nor is it the surviving Jerusalem of the millennial, millennium, which serves as a capital from which Jesus rules during the thousand years of peace. This is a new Jerusalem brought down from heaven, as we'll see. Well, as in, in verse 1. <clears throat> the heavenly city was referred to in, well, I guess we skip over that. No, I had a verse there. No, don't have a verse. Uh, the heavenly city referred to is in Hebrews 10, whose designer and builder is God. 
and the Jerusalem, New Jerusalem mentioned in Hebrews 12, 22, and 24 is what we have here. <clears throat> You've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. The Jews figured heaven was going to be the Messiah ruling in the city of Jerusalem from Israel. Uh, heaven to us, we'll see in chapter 21, is coming down from heaven. Now that's an interesting statement because it would seem that heaven is coming down from heaven. But what we have here is two different heavens. One is the heaven we dwell in. The other is the heaven from where it comes, where God has been dwelling eternally with the angels. <clears throat> and who was there in that in that celestial heaven? The innum innumerable company of angels, the uh, our God, the judge of all, uh, Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and spirits of just men, those who have gone on before us, <clears throat> and their spirits dwelling there in heaven waiting for the um, <clears throat> rapture to take place and all the spirits and bodies put back together. <clears throat> we have um, Revelations... There's the chapter, there's the verse, Revelations 21, 1, and I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer is. Now, this is the first biblical mention of the heaven that we will dwell in for all eternity. This is the first time <clears throat> it talked about Jerusalem, but didn't get into the fact that we will be there. Mentioned there, uh, the word heaven, uh, occurs in the Bible well over 300 times, but it's referring to our heaven as we stand outside and we look up, we see the clouds, we see the atmosphere. You s with a telescope, we see further into the sp into space. We call that heaven. That's the heaven that the Bible refers to hundreds of times. Then there's the heaven out of which God sends forth his angels, sends forth, uh, sp he speaks out of heaven, and where the trinity of God and the angels dwell. That is the celestial heaven. We're going to talk about a different heaven. John attempts to describe this indescribable, into this in indescribable uh, <clears throat> building using analogies to precious gems and metals. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away and the sea is no longer. Something catastrophic, whether man-made or God's doing, must have happened to destroy the earth and heaven and the atmosphere as we understand it. All the things that we understand were, uh, would be destroyed. Now, I looked it up. Uh, I, one of my favorite com commentaries or uh, com uh, favorite uh, theologians who does commentaries is Matthew Henry. And when I, asked, when I looked at what he talks about, he says, by the new earth, we may understand a new state for the bodies of men as well as a heaven for their souls. He is putting together, I'm not sure how he does it, <clears throat> but he's saying that the new heaven and the new earth, the new earth is for the body and the, the new heaven is for the soul and they come together and, we, and in the rapture we are joined. Um, the world is not now newly created, but newly opened. So what he is saying here is that our understanding of heaven and earth is going to be completely different from what we understand today. And filled with all those who were the heirs of it. The new heaven and new earth will not then be distinct, interesting, and very earth of the saints, the glorified bodies, will now be spiritual and heavenly and suited to those pure and bright mansions to make way for the commencement of this new world, the old world, with all its troubles and commotions passed away but he doesn't explain how he understands them passing away. Uh, he was writing before the Civil War. They didn't have nuclear weapons, weapons before the Civil War. The fact that Earth can be destroyed today with the nuclear weapons that exist wasn't known to Matthew Henry back in the 1700s. <clears throat> so he's talking about it being passed away from a, a theological perspective. Then we have in the second verse, there, well, there's Matthew Henry. He newly created, newly opened, filled with those who were the heirs of it. New heaven, new earth will not be distinct. Uh, 
Um, I'm not sure. I, I love to read his commentary, but I'm not sure that I follow exactly what he means in this commentary. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer is. That's the second verse of chapter 21. So John sings the holy city, coming down from God out of heaven as a bride prepared for her husband. Interesting. John saw <clears throat> heaven as being the church. Well, the church is going to dwell in heaven. So John is putting heaven and the church together and calling that the bride of Christ. <clears throat> I see it as an analogy how we dress up a venue for a wedding. Our niece had a, no, I'm sorry, our granddaughter and niece both had a wedding in a barn venue. That barn was dressed up in incredibly. I mean, it just, it just looked great. And I'm thinking that maybe this is what John is alluding to. The mystery is that the new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven, and that's where I said heaven coming down out of heaven, but based on 22.3, the new city will be a dwelling place. One of the things that's going to happen is no more pain. I like that picture. No more crutches, no more you jumping around because he's no more pain and no more broken bones. <clears throat> And uh, in Revelation 22, 3, this new city will be the dwelling place of our God and our Savior. Does this mean that God changes dwelling places? He's in the uh, celestial heaven, and now he's going to dwell in this new Jerusalem, what we are calling heaven. Somewhere along the line, God and the angels and the Lord Jesus are trading places from the celestial heaven, and we're all going to be dwelling with God in this. And that's, that's where I've I labored over this for, for many hours, trying to figure that one out. <clears throat> Will there still be a celestial heaven? I'm not sure, because the New Jerusalem is where God is going to set up everything for us. In 21, 5, and 7, we have a better, uh, another uh, description of the physical structure. And he said to me, write for these words are true and faithful. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. For him whose thirst I will give the fountain of water of life freely. He who overcomes and inherits all things, I will be his God. He will be my son. We have a completely different relationship with God in the New Jerusalem. We're his sons now, but we're going to have a close, familial, intimate relationship because we're going to be able to see and look at and perhaps sit next to but at least kneel before the very God of the universe. In the Old Testament, it scared people to death because they would say, oh, we've seen God, we're going to die. We're not going to die. We're going to be there with God in heaven in this new Jerusalem. And then in uh, uh, okay, there we go. In, in verse 8, we say, who is not going to be in heaven, but the fearful, unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars will have their part in the lake burning with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. So here's a short list of who is not going to be there. Then we come down to 10 through 14. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me a great city. This structure is so enormous that to get the true perspective, John had to be taken up to a mountain, high up in a mountain, to see the city. And even then, he was still, and you'll see when I see they show you the numbers, he was still looking up at the city, but he was getting a better perspective of it. <clears throat> the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and its light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal and it was a great and high wall with 12 gates and, and at the gates were 12 angels and the names inscribed which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel 
from the east three gates, from the north three gates, from the south three gates, from the west three gates. And the wall of the city was, had 12 foundations in them, and in them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. We have a magnificent wall. We have foundations, 12 foundations. It's interesting because most buildings that we're familiar with have one foundation. So the thinking here is that the 12 foundations have to do with these 12 apostles because they are the foundation of the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Their gospel teaching, their gospel preaching were the foundation that we, that we are built on. So these possibly are the foundations that are being referred to. What we have here is an absolutely perfect environment. No more of the things we fear like pain and death, consequently no tears or crying, including no fear of anything in the future, and enjoying God's presence. <clears throat> and it says that he carried me away. Uh, let's see. Now we're beginning to see and get an idea of how magnificent heaven will be. The structure is so high. As I said, John had to be taken to a high mountain to get a true understanding of the size. Now, the next couple of verses, we're going to see a little bit about the design of this amazing city. And he who talked to, with me had a golden reed to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city lies four square. So it's a square, e even, even distance on all four sides. And the length is as large as the breadth. And he measures the city with a reed, 12,000 stata, stadia. Works out to be in the range of 1,350 to 1,500 miles on each side. And it's not only a square, it's a cube. So you have 1,350 miles or 1,500, depend, they say German miles. So I, I go with the 1,350 miles, 1,350 miles, and then 1,350 miles. And I started calculating what that works out to be, square feet and sizes and things like that. And I'll show you that in a minute. <clears throat> and what's interesting is there, there is no ruler that can stretch out that long. So this had to be some kind of a spiritual, um, um, incredible reed that he measured with. And uh, I can't imagine that he took a reed and walked out for 1,350 miles because... <laughs> That would have taken a little while, but that is not explained to us. Uh, the city, the, the, the crystal clear like a jasper. The artist has, has shown it this way in the fact that uh, it was just a shiny, well, you talk about a, a shiny city on the hilltop. This was a shiny city. Um, it, it's, this obviously, the artist didn't get the... Uh, dimensions of the cube at this point. He was just showing a city that was kind of translucent, kind of shiny in gold. <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you about the walls of the city. This is our facility in Nigeria. We have a wall around this campus that's about nine feet tall, covered and, and topped with concertina barbed wire. And if you've seen that, you know it's very hard to climb through because it's, it's circular and it's got barbs all the way around so it's somewhat of a protection force. And um, it doesn't show up in this picture, but there is a uh, small house outside that we house four soldiers from the army in Nigeria, and they help guard. And we've got five guards inside with shotguns. Uh, unfortunately, unless God protects those who are there, uh, the enemy could easily overtake that facility. Uh, I have a picture of Boko Haram in uh, mounted vehicles with 50 caliber machine guns. And uh, we pray every day that God will treat these men like he treated the men in Sodom, blinding them so they've, they, they wearied themselves trying to find the door to Lot's, to Lot's house. And I'm praying that God would blind these men to weary them and not be able to find this facility. Because the building on the left is a two-story school building. And right now, we have somewhere in the range of 600 kids coming into school in two or three shifts. The, <clears throat> uh, 
Um, on, on the left-hand side of that building is a second school building, which will probably take up three floors. It's been approved because of the foundation. It's been approved for three floors. <coughs> and that will allow us to bring the students in and give them all day and not have to break it up into three sessions or three waves of kids coming and going. Um, that's just an I that's just to compare that to heaven uh, it, there is there very little comparison it's just it, the analogy just doesn't hold true but I just want to show you that man does build walls around buildings um, that's the big argument in our southern border a wall and uh, consequently we have a wall around the New Jerusalem that's about 70 yards more than 200 feet 200 feet tall which is amazing when you think about the size of the building that you would need to have a wall 200 feet tall, but, but that's the way God built it. Um, the gates were giant pearls, uh, and there are 12 gates, so there are 12 giant pearls to get in and out of the city. And the Bible tells us, and we'll see that in a minute, that the... Uh, uh, Let's see. The gates were never closed. And I found that interesting. So the fact that the gates were never closed, what we see here, the, the mention of the angels at, the, at, the, uh, at each of the gates, we don't see the names of the 12 tribes on the gates, uh, but that would infer that we have born-again Christians who are in heaven because the names of the tribes are there on the gates. We have the Lord Jesus at this point welcoming, welcoming us in. But these gates are open. Think about it. There is, uh, we'll see in a minute, there, or we've already seen, there's no night in this city. God is the light. There's no sun, there's no moon, and there's no night, which I'm assuming also, if you look up there, you might not see any stars either. But we have a celestial, we have a, a, an, essentially an earthly city, that is lit all the time. It's bright all the time. That tells me that we're not going to have to be using nighttime to rest. Our new bodies are going to have the energy to keep just going and going and going. And never. It's interesting because um, I am a member of the uh, Upper Euclid Municipal Authority. I have been for 20 years. That's the sewer committee. And we manage the sewers in the town. There's no mention of sewage anywhere in these chapters. But there's mentions of feasts, people sitting and eating. Um, I'm not sure if there's going to be any meat at these feasts. Obviously, God can provide the meat. Uh, we make things that taste like meat out of tofu and other materials. But how... What kind of meals we're going to have, I don't know, but they're going to be amazing meals. And what happens after we finish eating? There's obviously, maybe it doesn't go anywhere. I don't know. It's just, there's a lot of things about this that are mysteries. And uh, some of these mysteries I'd like to talk to the Lord about and uh, try to get some answers. This is an idea of what this city looks like. There's, the country, there's our country from, the, uh, from outer space. The, uh, the, in this case, they used the German measure of 1,500 miles. Uh, that's a pretty tall building. And uh, it takes up, well, let me show you what the footprint looks like. There we go. You've got, in this case, 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. Uh, the last picture was a 1,500 miles up. This is a 1,500 miles wide and deep. And you see it covers half of our country. Now, I think the New Jerusalem will probably come down in the Middle East. I don't know that for sure, but I suspect it'll be in the Middle East because that would be Jerusalem, or that'd be Israel. But just to get an idea of the size of this structure. Um, now, I, I put the calculator to use, and I, I may have, uh, the numbers are so staggering, I'm not sure I did it right. Heavenly dimensions. In a mile, there are, 
Well, it's, I said let's go with the 1,350 miles by, to the side. There are 5,280 5, feet to a mile. If you look at dwellings with 15-foot ceilings, now, I, don't th I think we have a 12-foot ceiling here, maybe something like 15-foot. I have been in a house with a 12 to 15-foot ceiling, and it just felt so spacious, and I think that's what we're going to experience. Just the amount of space is unbelievable. Now, with 15-foot ceilings, you could have floor, you could have 475,200 floors. Think about an elevator. How long would it take the elevator to go through that? There's no talk about elevators. I, don't, I have a feeling because Jesus could walk through doors. Uh, Philip could go from one place to another place in, in a transport. I don't think we're going to need a. Tr we'll be transported around this place. Uh, you have 1,822,500 square miles, miles per floor. You have 50 trillion... 808 billion square feet per floor. That's what I'm saying. The numbers start to become just beyond our understanding. Now, if you take an average home, and in America, the average home is 1,400 square feet. Nowhere else in the rest of the world is a home that big. The rest of the world would live in something completely smaller than that. But if you look at 1,400 square feet, you could have 36 billion 291 million average homes per floor, per floor. Now, I might have gotten that wrong. That might have been the total. Um, but I believe that's per floor. Now, interest, oops. That's before you include space for an immense theater. I was to the Billy Graham crusade in Philadelphia. And uh, I think we probably had Fifteen to 20,000 people there, and I was in the choir, and it was an enormous, it was an incredible sound. Now start looking at an amphitheater that would hold 8, 9, 10, 20 million, 30 million people, uh, because we're all going to be able to be gathered around our Lord, our God. And I have a feeling that the center of this enormous structure is this enormous Amphitheater to hold everybody so we can get to all together in worshiping our God. So I don't know how to take out the size of the amphitheater out of the equation and figure out, but there's obviously way more room than we could ever imagine using. Just an incredible amount of space that, that John's describing here. And the fact that uh, the foundations were adorned with precious stones. The floor and the streets were transparent gold, uh, like the guy that arrived at the pearly gates with his bags of money. And St. Peter said, why are you bringing Macadam to heaven? I mean, he was bringing his gold with him. You'd, heaven is going to be golden. It's just there's no imagination of how much gold there will be in that, in that city. We have, um, as I said, in Revelations 21, 22, um, we see that, oh, wrong way. I saw no temple in it. Well, okay. Would, would I consider the amphitheater the temple or? Okay, there's no temple, so there's no structure as the Jews understood the temple in Israel. But we would, I imagine we would need space for us to all get around the throne. For the Lord God Almighty is its temple, even the Lamb. And the city had no need of the sun nor of the moon that they might shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations of those who are saved will walk in by the light of it, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it, and its gates may not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. No reason for security, because at night we close the doors, we lock the doors, because it's dark outside, and that's when the thieves break in and steal. There's no dark there. <clears throat> now, just a thought. 
The gates are open at all times. What that means is we can come in or we can go out. We're not confined in any way, shape, or form. There will be no aspect, even as big as it is, there will be no aspect of prison life being closed in at all the time. We can go out or we can come in. And I'm thinking, why would we want to go out? What if we were allowed to explore the universe? What if we were allowed to go anywhere we wanted to in the universe? Why would we want to leave heaven? I don't know. But maybe you're curious about what the planets look like. And you, in your new body, you could go anywhere in this universe that you desired. Like that. So there's aspects of the in and out that they're, again, a mystery. We're going to have to see how the answers come out for that mystery and uh, see what the Lord has to tell us there. And what will we do with all the time on our hands? Revelations does not mention anything about that other than the fact that uh, there will be uh, the elders and the... Uh, the elders and the angels fell down and worshiped God. Pastor Jeffers wrote a devotional on 1 Corinthians 10, 31. He said, heaven will be a place of indescribable worship. Just think about a worship experience when you were moved to a very innermost part of your being and you felt connected to God. And I was thinking to myself, how often do we get that kind of a feeling? that we just spend time with the Lord and worship. Think about the great moments of worship and multiply it by a million. That is what heaven is going to be like, because in heaven we will actually see Jesus face to face. No experience will match that. In Revelations 5, 11, 12, John described the worship we will experience in heaven. I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. They praised with a loud voice. Then he gave a story to illustrate that. On December 2nd, 2013, Fans of the Seattle Seahawks set a world record as the loudest fans in the NFL. During a third down defensive stand against the New Orleans Saints, the Seahawks fans produced an ear-splitting 137.6 decibel noise. The roar of a jet engine 100 feet away produces 140. <coughs> This was almost equal to the roar of a jet engine. Now, I don't think you can hear the jet engine in the cockpit. Can you? A you, little bit. I know you can hear it when you're sitting on the, next to the wing because I'd, I didn't mind sitting next to the wing. It just bothered, bothered me because I couldn't see below, but the noise was there. The roar of a jet engine. The Seahawk fans praise for the team was so loud it triggered a minor earthquake. That's the kind of worship we're going to have in heaven. Can you believe that? That's amazing when you think about the millions and millions of redeemed people singing and shouting praise to God and to the Lord Jesus Christ in this city that he's built for us and is in the process of finishing. Now, I'm hoping to be in the heavenly choir. I've been in a choir before, I sang bass. Um, the, the, the thinking, the general thinking is that when we're resurrected, we'll probably be resurrected into bodies that are around 33 years old. So everybody, the thinking is everybody in heaven, because that's where Jesus was. He was about 33 years old, and our resurrection will be similar to his. So the thinking is everybody will be 33 years old. That'll be interesting. Um, what will we do besides singing? Well, and shouting, as we saw the Seahawks do. How about breakout sessions? To hear the experience of countless of people who have undergone all kinds of 
uh, trials and tribulations. What about exploring and admiring the new surroundings? <clears throat> you have a building that's 1,350 miles in any direction. How long will it take you to explore and to look at the beauty of what God has created and shown and, shown and built for us? What about updating your knowledge? Maybe you already have it, but updating your knowledge on spiritual things and events. Um, do you have some questions that you'd like to ask some of the authors about in the Word of God. Maybe that'd be a breakout session. Anybody interested in listening to John over here in this corner? Anybody listening to Mark over? In those kinds of things. What about spending quiet time in personal praise and exaltation to my Creator and my Savior? And you know, how many loved ones have gone on before us? Wouldn't you love to sit down and share experiences and, and renew acquaintances and Bring them up to date on what has been happening while they were gone. I mean, there's so many things that I don't think we'll ever get bored in heaven. There will be so many things to do. We'll not, the list will be far longer than we can handle. And uh, we won't ever have to be worried about, well, what I, well, obviously you're not going to have to worry about what you're going to do when you wake up. Because you're not going to be waking up. It's going to be just a, a continual cycle. And now th that continual cycle might represent a problem to some people. But if you're not going to get tired, if you're not going to get sick, if you're not going to get feel bad about anything, how, how good can that be? That's an amazing place that we're talking about. And it is explained there in chapter 21. Chapter 22 actually goes on and explains it further. Talks about a river of life. And uh, there's <clears throat> that, that would be for another time. It's, um, it goes on and talks about the blessings and, uh, that God has for us there in heaven. <clears throat> Our God and Father, we are amazed. We are just incredulous when we think about what you're building for us. This heaven that is described by John, there's the New Jerusalem, is going to be a place that is beyond belief, beyond understanding. And we won't be able to explore it all. Uh, we'll have the time to do it, perhaps, but I, I, I have a feeling we'll, we'll, we'll never tired of exploring it. We'll never tired of being around your feet and singing praises and worshiping you and shouting our praises out to you. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for what you did and look forward to being there at your feet and worshiping you as you sit there on the right hand of the Father in glory and honor. And I know the angels will be watching us and perhaps even taking part in all this praise with us because they're singing your praises now. So we thank you for what you've given us in the book of Revelations. We're thanking you for the, uh, the fact that there are still mysteries. There are still things that we don't understand. And we pray that we'll have time in eternity to, to, to open up these things that we don't understand, to understand the, the immensity of what you've done for us and what you're doing and and what you have prepared for us. We just give you praise. We give you thanks. In our Savior's worthy and precious name, amen.